so uh, thank you again to the organizers for inviting me here and after the uh, elaborate and very uh, clinical talk by dr jay i am going on to something uh, which for the clinicians is a kind of an enigma always it's about immunohistochemistry in ovarian cancer and how it is utilized by the clinician to interpret the reports and how uh, uh, appropriate therapy is initiated now before i go into the nuances of ovarian cancer i would just briefly want to tell you what is immunohistochemistry so uh, immunohistochemistry is a method by which we detect uh, certain antigens in the tissue so ovarian cancer for example you have cervical uh, you have uh, uh, high grade serous cancer low grade serous cancer mucinous cancer uh, what are the types of cancers so how do you subtype these cancers there are certain specific antigens which are expressed by these tumors and with the help of immunohistochemistry we use antibodies to stain these sections with particular antibodies and then try to delineate what type of tissue this is so why is immunohistochemistry important in surgical pathology it tells you the cell lineage and tissue type it gives you prognostic markers it gives you predictive markers and you uh, the the patients are very knowledgeable they know, know all about this uh, more than any of us because they read, go through the internet so the importance of immunohistochemistry is basically to what type of tissue it is what type of tumor it is how to prognosticate them and what are the predictive markers in general just as an example i am telling you so supposing this pink stuff which you see here is is this tumor on the slide supposing this is an ovarian tumor it will express certain types of antigens which differentiates it from other ovarian type of tumors so what we do in immunohistochemistry we add a primary antibody and we label it with secondary antibody and finally we see a brown colored product under the microscope which we interpret as a positive ic staining so this is just a pictorial representation for brief methodology of what is immunohistochemistry uh, automated things have come up and this is uh, one from our own lab which is the benchmark xt from ventana uh, all these procedures completely automated with the help of software and uh, we get a finished product in these so this is the staining module this is the automatic module and the uh, system so this is how the slides are kept on this automated stainer and they are stained with different protocols these are all the reagents which are used and finally we get a colored product on the slide which we interpret as ihc now coming on to ovarian tumor classification uh, which has already been alluded by dr jaya and various other speakers we know that as far as pathology is concerned there are epithelial tumors germ cell tumors and then the lesser common uh, uh, un, uh, uh, uncommon ones which are the sex cord stromal tumors so 60 to 75% are of the ovarian cancers are of the carcinoma group and about 15 to 20% are of the germ cell category so coming to epithelial ovarian cancers and the use of immunohistochemistry in these tumors uh, we know that ovarian cancer is not a homogeneous disease so when we refer to the word ovarian carcinoma it doesn't make uh, have any meaning we have to distinguish between high grade serous endometrioid low grade serous cancer clear cell carcinoma and mucinous all of these come up in different uh, uh, presentations and different uh, age groups and in the different background for example endometrioid and clear cell would come up in a background of long standing endometriosis high grade serous dr jay has just uh, presented that many braca patients would develop and then you have low grade serous and borderline tumors which are another category of tumors uh, so this is another pictorial representation to show that high grade serous cancer is one of the commonest ones which has the dp53 braca mutations whereas the endometrioid and clear cell are arid 1a driven tumors uh, now coming to uh, high grade ovarian cancers it is now very well known that up to 50 to 70% of what we call as ovarian cancers originate in the fimbrial end of the of the uh, of the fallopian tube so something known as a pre invasive or a stick or a serous tubal intraepithelial carcinoma develops in the fimbrial end of the fallopian tube and from there it drops onto the ovary and presents as a large ovarian mass by the time it it presents to the clinician so most of the high grade serous cancers of the ovary actually originate from the fimbrial end of the ovarian tube so what are the two types of ovarian cancers we know that type 1 carcinomas include serous endometrioid clear cell this is an old terminology i would suggest we don't use it uh, often so uh, and the common ones are the high grade and the carcinosarcomas the most important point for the clinician for the surgeon for the medical oncologist is to distinguish a high grade serous from a low grade serous cancers and under the microscope uh, we look at certain features like the nuclear atypia the mitosis necrosis and the presence or absence of multinucleated tumor giant cells which helps us in morphologically distinguishing a high grade from a low grade serous carcinoma 
So let us take a couple of cases and scenarios. We have a 58 year old lady with a large solid cystic ovarian pelvic mass with omental deposits and ascites. So first of all, we will do an ascitic fluid tap. And this is a ball like cluster of malignant cells. You can see the very high NC ratio of these tumor cells here. Very, uh, you can clearly see that they were a high grade malignant tumor. Higher power to show again the very large size of the tumor nuclei, high NC ratio. Uh, are stain to shade this ball of tumor cells under the microscope. The background cells are the, uh, the background, you see the mesothelial cells. And then we do a cell block preparation. So we take this cytology fluid, we process it like a histology section. And this is how adenocarcinoma glands look under the microscope. So this slide is full of adenocarcinoma glands, which are seen in the cell, cell block. And to find out whether it is Mullerian origin, we use Paxate as a marker. So Paxate is a good marker for Mullerian origin. WT1 is a serous marker and CK7 is a marker of, again, uh, uh, epithelial origin. Uh, in this case, it is a serous carcinoma. So Paxate and WT1 will tell you that it's a serous cancer. And again, picture another picture to show the same, uh, um, a lot of tumor cells which are positive for cytokeratin 7. Paxate is a nuclear marker, it stains the nuclei. WT1 is again a nuclear marker which shows that it's a serous cancer. So Paxate is a pan Mullerian marker. So all the clinicians should understand that when you see a report as Paxate, it basically tells you possibly it's a Mullerian tumor. Another uh, uh, picture to show you biopsy of, a, of an adnex cell mass. This shows the adenocarcinoma here uh, at the edge of the biopsy. You can see that these are very malignant looking cells. And P53 is a stain which needs to be interpreted properly. So if you look at the nuclei of these all tumor cells, all are very strongly and brightly brown in color. They are very brightly and strongly brown in color and diffusely positive. So this is a P53 mutant tumor, which would occur in a high grade serous cancer, which are P53 mutation positive. This is WT1 positive, which is a serous marker and Paxate positive, which is a Mullerian marker. So we have a Mullerian tumor, which expresses WT1 and it shows P53 mutation that makes it a high grade serous adenocarcinoma of the ovary. Uh, so, so this is the same tumor which is seen under the uh, as, as a gross section with a solid and cystic area. Uh, when it was resected, you see this uh, hyaline globules, you see this very bizarre looking tumor cells under the microscope. So this occurs in high grade serous adenocarcinomas. The other tumors which you come across are the endometroid which form this glandular pattern and the immunohistochemistry for this is basically to do ERPR, these are generally WT1 negative. WT1 positive is in serous cancers. And these are strongly ERPR positive in most uh, grade 1, grade 2 tumors of the uh, endometrial type. Clear cell carcinoma, as the name suggests, the cytoplasm is very clear. You can see very empty looking cytoplasm of many of these cells. And these, this is what happens in the clear cell adenocarcinoma. Another picture to show clear cell adenocarcinoma with a lot of these kind of cells with clear cytoplasm, a uh, lot of clear cytoplasm here. And what is the IHC to pick this up? The most important IHC which we use is napsin, napsin, napsin A. So napsin A is, is a marker for clear cell adenocarcinoma. Mind you, it is also positive for cytokeratin 7, just like serous cancer. So you should have a napsin A in your ammonitor to pick up clear cell. Clear cell carcinoma is negative negative for, for WT1, and MIB1 index can show the uh, proliferative activity of these tumor cells. Coming to another scenario, 27-year-old unmarried girl with ovarian mass, and radiologically it is predominantly cystic. This is a biopsy from the from the uh, omentum of the same patient, showing a lot of somomatous calcification. Uh, again, papillae of tumor, papillary tumor. And again, if you look at P53 staining. So for both low grade and high grade, we use a P53 stain. A P53 staining is wild type or it is not diffuse and strong in low grade, whereas it is, as we had seen earlier, it is diffuse and strong in high grade serious cancer. So P53 is of utmost importance in distinguishing a high grade and a low grade serous cancer. So this is again a picture of low grade serous carcinoma. Paxate is a Mullerian marker, it is positive. MIB1 is low. ER is strongly positive in low grade serous cancer. More pictures to show low grade serous cancer, strongly positive for ER. Wild type staining for P53, not very strong. Wild type staining, not diffuse in the tumor cells. WT1 is positive in uh, low grade serous cancer also. So a word about P53 immunohistochemistry. When do you call it mutant positive or abnormal positive? When you have diffuse strong positivity in 70 to 75% of the nuclei, then it should then only it should be called as P53 positive. Sometimes you have complete absence of P53 in the nuclear tumor cells. That's called null mutation. So that's also occurs in high grade serous cancer. So this is also seen in high grades. And then you have 
very rarely cases where you have only cytoplasmic positivity or diffuse positivity, which is also considered. When it is patchy nucleus staining, it is considered as wild type, and that is seen in low grade cancer, low grade serous carcinomas. So this is a picture of uh, again a borderline uh, serous tumor with low grade serous areas. So this is how a low grade a borderline serous tumor and low grade serous carcinoma looks like. Under the microscope, you have these lot of fronding and these kind of papillae within them. Uh, micro papillary appearance of the papillae, more micro papillary appearance. You can see this very long slender papillae which are arising from them. So this is a long slender micro papillary and this is the omental uh, implants which are invasive implants in this case. Coming quickly to mucinous tumors, uh, gross pictures of certain mucinous tumors, very tense looking fluid filled cavity, multiloculated cyst with some solid areas here. And then under the microscope, you see this mucinous adenocarcinoma, which is infiltrating into stroma and just causing destructive stromal invasion, nuclear intermediate to high grade. The million dollar question in a mucinous ovarian tumor for the clinician is uh, what to do? What, which, is, which, which mucinous tumor is it? Is, is it a primary mucinous tumor of the ovary or is it metastasis from elsewhere, mostly a GI tract primary? So what are the immunohistochemistry chemistry panel for these mucinous ovarian tumors? It includes CK7, cytokeratin 20, SATB2 and CDX2. These all help in delineating an intestinal phenotype. So if you have your mucinous ovarian tumor, which is positive for CK20, SATB2, CDX2, it probably is from a lower GI tract. If it is CK7 positive, uh, maybe or may not be 20 positive. In CDX2, it may be from the upper tract. So uh, upper, upper GI tract. So a combination of these markers we use to pinpoint. Mind you, if Paxit comes positive in the nuclear of mucinous tumor, it's most likely a primary ovarian uh, mucinous origin. Obviously, to decide on that, many times you will have the patient will have to undergo upper and lower GI endoscopy. And uh, uh, again, the age of the patient is important. Bilaterality is important. Size of the tumors is important to decide whether it's a primary mucinous versus uh, uh, secondary from uh, elsewhere. So this is an image to show CK7. This is an image to show CK20. And this is SATB2 and CDX2, which are nuclear positive markers in uh, mucinous ovarian tumors. Uh, last but not the least, germ cell tumors, small, uh, again, a small category of 15% tumors in the ovary. Uh, mostly they occur in the age group of 14 to 54. Mostly would be from uh, 14 to 35 to 40 age group. Uh, that's important. Uh, the most common is the dysgerminoma, which is classically seen and classically picked up by the pathologist. Not, most of the times we don't resort to IHC in such cases. But if you want to use immunohistochemistry, cytoxy kit is one of the marker. Uh, which picks up uh, dysgerminoma and the other IHCs which we commonly employ for dysgerminoma IHC profile is uh, D240 and OC34. So these are certain germ cell markers uh, which we pick up. The other new marker which has come up for germ cell is the SAL4, which I'll just be alluding to later. So this is a picture of uh, yolk sac tumor with this Schiller dual kind of bodies which you classically seen and described. Uh, these are positive for glipican. Three yolk sac tumors are nicely positive for glipican. Uh, three positivity and the other markers for yolk sac are SAL4, uh, GATA3 and A1A3. So the prob uh, issue is if somebody in the lab does only an A1A3 uh, in a germ cell tumor, they may end up calling it as a carcinoma. And that's the importance of doing a panel of markers and not a single marker. O obviously, the serum AFP and all those factors have to be taken into consideration, including the age of the patient. This is a picture of choriocarcinoma with very highly malignant looking cells and malignant looking nuclei. These are positive for A1A3, again, keratin positive. And the importance of this, again, to do GATA3 for these markers. Obviously, the right setting of beta HCG and the clinical scenario is important to confirm the diagnosis. Uh, embryonal carcinomas, very malignant looking, most uh, bizarre looking tumor cells in this. They are positive for A1A3, CD30, and OC34. So these are certain markers which in the lab we employ. So the, the importance of these things are... Uh, especially embryonal carcinoma, if you have a sizable complement of embryonal carcinoma, those tumors would fall into an intermediate to poor risk category uh, more in most of settings and would require a higher regimen of, of uh, chemotherapy or a higher num more number of cycles of chemotherapy in the setting. Uh, last is the sex cord stromal tumor, not very common tumors, but we do see in a setting to great extent at least granulosa cell tumor, Sertoli tumor and Sertoli radic are very less in numbers and fibroma thicoma are benign tumors. The most important immunohistochemical markers which we utilize to pick up these are inhibin, calretinin, MIC2, and melanin. So these are markers which come positive in, in sex cord stromal tumors. And again, a combination of these is necessary. 
uh, many of the tumors would be inhibin calreticin positive and i'll show you a couple of examples this is a good example of granulosa cell tumor with very nice nuclear grooving you can see the nuclear grooves in these uh, tumor cells coffee bean kind of appearance of these nuclei and they are strongly positive for inhibin staining so with that i come to the end and i would like to acknowledge my gynepath colleagues my gyne dmg colleagues especially dr jay and dr amita and dr shaila shri uh, uh, dr seema many of them so we keep on interacting and we uh, keep on helping each other in 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 many ways to understand uh, the various pathologies and clinical scenarios thank you very much